Hi everyone, this is Marianne and welcome to a series on my channel called 5-Minute Book Talk in which I take roughly 5 minutes to talk about a book that I have read while I flip through the book. In this video, I'm going to talk about the novel State of War by Ninochka Roska. Now, this is not a new book. It was first published in 1988 and I myself purchased the Kindle version in 2013, but I never really got to read it until recently. And I also feel that I have to say something about the author because it's very important. Ninochka Roska is a Filipina born and raised in the Philippines, and she was a political activist in the country during the martial law era that was headed by the dictator Ferdinand E. Marcos Sr., and she was one of the many people taken as prisoner by the regime. She was released, and when she heard that she was going to be taken into custody again, that's when she flew to the United States. So this novel is heavily informed by her first-hand experience of all of the horrors of martial law in the Philippines. So just keep that in mind. Also, it goes without saying that this video will have some spoilers. This novel is structured into three main parts and it spans two different eras of the same timeline. Part 1 is set in the martial law era in the Philippines and opens with a trio of friends who attended a festival in one of the islands of the Philippines. And by the way, the Philippines, being an archipelago, has more than 7,000 islands. These three friends are called Adrian, Anna, and Eliza, and their friendship is rooted in their common goal to fight the fascism that's going on in the Philippines in the novel. And in the novel, the ruling oppressive force is being led by a commander, and he has all of these military people under him who are implementing the oppressive practices, which includes arresting and imprisoning and torturing anyone who fights or even just speaks out against the rule of the commander. Now, Anna is married to Manolo, who is also an activist like her, but he was captured by the regime, and then the people who informed Anna that her husband was dead even showed her pictures of him, you know, dead in a very horrible manner, so Anna just thought that he was dead. And in this same part, part one, Adrian is also captured and drugged all during the festival, which was very chaotic and very, very colorful, but really it was pure chaos. Part 1 happens in just a few days, encompassing the multi-day celebration of the festival in the island. Part 2 is set during the Spanish colonial period in the Philippines, and we are shown a different set of characters, and this part is my absolute favorite part of the novel, largely because I suppose there is less physical violence here, although of course there is always violence going on during any part of the colonization process. Part 2 spans three generations of one family, and in this part, in part 2, the deeper connections between and among the characters in part 1 are revealed. And it's not because of fate or destiny or anything like that, neither does the novel romanticize these connections. Instead, the novel cements, in part two, the idea that we are the products of so many different things that have happened to us, that happen to people that we know, happen to people that we don't know, things done to our country by people we know and people we don't know, and only partly by our own personal decisions on how to navigate all of that. In other words, when you live in a colonized country, you are not really the master of your fate. You cannot be. It's impossible. There is always an oppressive system ruling over you, preventing you from doing the things that you want to do and have to do on pain of literal death. And during part one and part three of the novel, which is set in the 1980s, we were no longer a colonized country, but an oppressive ruling force was still over us. There was martial law, and there was a dictator who styled himself to be some kind of demigod who felt that he had every right to punish everyone who defies his power. How can you be free within that system without being murdered? Of course, there's still human agency, as in anything, but if the most logical conclusion Conclusion of exercising your human agency is death, what are you going to do? Part 3 continues the story of Part 1, and in Part 3, Manolo is revealed to be alive, and he now works on the side of the fascist commander. And Anna had to do something before Manolo can leak to his bosses what Anna and Adrian and Eliza had been planning to do in the island all along. And then mayhem ensues, and of course, the fascist government wins. 
only hope remains, and that is what we have now in our country. It was just so painful to read this novel because I know it's just fictionalized, but it is also very, very real. If you just do your research, you will see all of the things that the martial law regime has done to our people and our country, and even before martial law and after martial law, Marcus still remained wielding power supported by his cronies. And now the son of Marcus is the current president of the Philippines. Are we really the masters of our fate? Or is that still an effect of the powers that are beyond our control and is rooted in our colonial experience? I feel like I have to give the author Ninochka Roska a very tight hug and protect her from any more pain, but she is one tough woman. She's open to debate, but if your facts are not straight or your logic is wonky, she is going to educate you. State of War is a very important novel. I highly recommend it.